Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Matt Roth with Baylor College of Medicine, and I welcome you to today's presentation. Uh, the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium is an NIH Common Fund program which works to advance the science and research of extracellular RNA. The consortium hosts monthly presentations on a variety of research topics, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Ken Whitler, who is an associate professor of molecular and comparative patho pathobiology, neurology, and molecular medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. The title of his presentation is EVs as Messengers of Inflammation in HIV Infection and Cigarette Use. Ken? Thanks so much, Matt. Um, I appreciate the introduction, and I also appreciate the, um, the, the uh, invitation to speak here today. Uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing some of our work on HIV infection and cigarette use with you. Um, I really like this mute feature because that lets you make all of your snide comments now and uh, and save the save, save your questions for later. Or you can make the snide comments to me. I mean, I, I love those too. Um, so in any case, um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed by all of the work that the ERCC um, investigators have done over the past few years. Um, and I've had the privilege to be uh, one of the external advisors for the, the past few years. And it's, it's really been, um, it's been, been exciting, I think, to see the progress that has come out of this uh, very important program. Um, so I want to um, uh, start by just reiterating what, what Matt said. My affiliations um, here at Johns Hopkins um, include my primary affiliation with the Department of Molecular and Comparative Pathobiology, um, and I'm one of the one of the investigators in our uh, so-called retrovirus laboratory, which has been investigating retroviruses, uh, beginning with uh, with some, uh, some some sheep and goat retroviruses back in the 1970s, and then moving on to HIV and of course SIV, from which uh, HIV derived um, after after HIV was discovered in the early 1980s. Um, I don't have any conflicts to, uh, to, to tell you about um, that are relevant to this presentation. Um, and my outline is, is simply going to be um, sharing some data about the role of EVs in cell growth and culture, um, and then in HIV replication and latency. Um, and then the last part of my talk will be on some of our recent research into cigarette smoke and how cigarette smoke affects cells and how cells um, uh, produce EVs under, under smoked conditions that can affect uh, the, the state of, of distant cells. So um, before beginning with any of my data, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and my lab members. Um, so shown here are, um, are two of the people who did a lot of the work that I'll show you, um, Dr. Liao and Dr. Muth in my lab. Um, also, our friendly Pikachu in the background. Um, and I'd also like to um, acknowledge some of my collaborators, including Matthias Ostrowski, Clotilde Terry, uh, Susmita Sahu, Erez Aiten, and Mark Matson, uh, some of whose um, uh, data from our collaborative projects I will show. Um, and then I'd also like to acknowledge the funding that we received from, from NIH and others, um, including <clears throat> funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, um, and uh, from aging, National Institute on Aging. So uh, we all know, and I know that many of you are, 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 are uh, investigating EVs as well, uh, that when we, when, we, when we study EVs in culture, we need to be sure that the EVs are coming from the cells um, and not from uh, additives in our medium. Um, and that would include chiefly the serum that we, we mostly use to nurture cells in culture. Um, so several, um, several ways of depleting extracellular vesicles from serum have, have been proposed. Um, so of course we could use a serum-free medium, and I'm going to show you some data uh, from uh, experiments that involve serum-free medium today. Uh, but then uh, and, you know, another, another method, especially if we don't have uh, uh, defined serum-free conditions, would be to deplete the serum itself of extracellular vesicles. So there are a few ways to do this. Um, there are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. Um, so the, if we go back to uh, Clotilde Thierry's paper from 2006 um, with Alan Clayton and others on um, a, a variety of methods for EV studies, um, in this paper it is described how one would uh, deplete EVs using ultracentrifugation. And this protocol, um, importantly, involves dilution. So you must dilute the serum before spinning it Otherwise, um, the, the, the serum is, is simply too viscous to allow efficient removal of EVs. 
So in, in the subsequent slides, I'm going to be referring to this method as UC, um, and the, <clears throat> the, the serum that is produced from this would be UC EVD for ultra centrifuge EV depleted. Um, another way to do this that many have used is, is, is ultra filtration. So you could do a sequential uh, filtration, taking out smaller and smaller particles um, until you're left with a fraction that contains very few EVs. Um, and so a recent example of this was, uh, was just published in JEV uh, last month, uh, January 2018, um, by Kornilov et al. Um, and of course, there are others who have done this. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, there, there are many commercial sources of depleted, um, ex, uh, uh, depleted FBS, for example. So Thermo Fisher, um, we, we've, we've uh, used EV depleted serum from Thermo Fisher, the Gibco exosome depleted FBS. We found that this is um, very nicely depleted. Um, in fact, they, they seem to do a better job than we can do um, using our, our, our in-lab methods. Um, and so this is a this is a product that we <clears throat> that we often use and that I will refer to as uh, TF EVD for Thermo Fisher EV depleted serum. All right. So several years ago, um, this date down here is wrong. Um, Era Zaitan, um, in in, uh, in in collaboration with us and uh, from Mark Matson's lab, had published a paper in Jev on how serum EVs can affect cell growth and survival. So it turns out uh, that when you deplete serum of EVs, the cells that are grown in those conditions um, do not proliferate as well as cells that are grown in replete serum conditions, so serum that is replete with, with EVs. Um, there are, this is not consistent across all cell lines. So, for example, in this, um, in this uh, A panel here, you see that the U87MG cells, uh, they're a glioblastoma line, they seem to do well in, in even EV-depleted conditions. Other cells, in contrast, um, do not do not uh, proliferate as quickly um, under depleted conditions. So this is um, <clears throat> this was also uh, we've also seen this in primary cells, um, and I'll show you some data later on um, from some cell lines that are that are uh, uh, that are very sensitive to EV depleted conditions. Uh, so uh, survival can also decrease somewhat in the serum depleted conditions. Um, the results do not seem to depend upon the serum source, so this is across different lots of serum, across different sources of serum, um, and it's also true for human serum. So you might ask the question of whether there's a difference between the bovine and the human serum in terms of the EV depletion. There does not appear to be. So since we are a lab that investigates HIV um, uh, chiefly, we wish to uh, extend these, these observations to the effects on the cells that we use to study HIV, and so these would include cell lines and primary cells. Um, so we investigated the effects of EV depletion on H9 and PM1 cells. These are T lymphocytic lines that uh, replicate different strains of HIV. We also used primary human CD4 positive T cells, uh, human monocyte derived macrophages, uh, and then we investigated two um, so-called latent lines. So these are um, these are cells. Uh, the ACH2s are, are T cell lines um, that harbor one copy of latent HIV, whereas the U1s are U937 promonocytic pro lines uh, that harbor two integrated copies of HIV. And so these are these are the ACH2s and the U1s are commonly used latency models. And so the effects of proliferation that were seen by by Erez and colleagues in the in the in the previous slide. Um, we, we also observe for our um, for our, our, our various cells that um, that are used in, in, our, in our HIV lab. Um, but when we infected uh, when we infected uninfected cells with HIV and grew them uh, in the different conditions, and so I, I want to just uh, remind you, replete means that this is grown in full serum conditions. UCEVD, this is our home home brew kind of uh, um, depleted protocol, and then TFEVD was the commercial. Um, the commercially depleted serum. So when we looked at the morphology of these infected cells, these H9 cells, um, we, we saw that um, under the progressively more depleted conditions, uh, the, cells, the cells were clumping together, uh, and they were also forming uh, more syncytia. So it seemed that the more depletion of EVs that occurred, the, the more um, these phenotypes were seen. And, and more than that, we saw that in, in, in both um, acutely infected cells, 
but then even more so in the latently infected cells, that altering the serum conditions, um, altering the culture conditions, had profound effects on the release of HIV. And so here on the left, I, um, I point you to the U1 cells. These again are the promonocytic cells that have two copies of latent HIV in them. And here we saw the, the most striking effects of depletion. So these cells were exquisitely sensitive um, to the to the EV depleted conditions. And by day 10, there were actually very few cells that were left. Um, despite that, um, on days six and nine of culture, we um, we observed that there was a lot more P24 release. Um, and I'm not showing the data here, but we we also did experiments to investigate whether um, that P24 release was actual virion release, um, or whether it could be explained simply by the death of cells. Um, and it appears that most of the most of the release, even in the late days, um, is, is actually coming from those cells that are still alive. Um, the effect was also seen in the ACH2 uh, T lymphocytic line. Um, here, there was not as much of an effect um, on the cell density on the on the proliferation. Um, but uh, here, this is a this is a, a log 10 scale, so that you can see that there was a very consistent and large um, effect of the serum depletion on production of latent HIV. Um, here's here's another um, another line that we sometimes use. Um, this line is called the JLAT, so these are derived from Jurcat or Jurcat cells, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and uh, they have a reporter uh, a reporter in them that we can measure by flow cytometry. So here um, we're growing, um, now, we're, now we're switching to completely serum-free medium. So when we grow these cells in AIM-5 serum-free medium versus R10 medium replete, um, you can see that by four, even by 48 hours, we see an increase in production of HIV um, from the cells that are uh, grown in the AIM-5 medium. And by 72 hours, this increase is even, even more marked. There was one clone um, that did not show us this increase. And interestingly enough, this is a line that had actually, in, in our hands anyway, lost its latency. So it was already producing a lot of virus um, to begin with. All right, so the question that you may be asking um, through your muted microphones right now is, did you, you know, did you do the obvious thing? And that would be to add back some EVs. Um, and yes, we did, and I'm going to show you those data, but I wanna start um, by talking about some of the characterization that we did with these EVs. Um, so the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, many of you know this journal. Um, this is the only, the only journal that's really devoted to the field, and it is now published by Taylor and Francis. Um, and this is the journal of, of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, or ISEV. And I'm, I'm throwing up this, um, this very interesting uh, uh, figure that we got from Scopus. So Scopus has an alternative, um, an alternative journal evaluation method that they call the site score. So this is like an impact factor, but it goes over more years. Um, and they also, um, they also take into account things like letters, um, which are, are not often uh, used in the, in the denominator of the calculation for impact factor. And interestingly enough, the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles here, I'm not sure why it's a histology journal, it's also a, a considered cell biology, um, but it's right below Nature Biotechnology and just a few runs up from New England Journal of Medicine, so quite interesting. Anyway, the, um, the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles as the, uh, um, the Society Journal of ISA has published multiple position papers on EV studies, uh, and these include an editorial several years ago that attempted to define uh, some of the minimal experimental requirements for EV studies. And this is more of a minimal information um, uh, recommendation than anything else, and it's sometimes referred to as MISEV. Um, so in, in, in the MISEV requirements, uh, there are several recommendations for how, how we should characterize extracellular vesicles that we've isolated um, in order to be able to say that they really are EVs. <clears throat> and this would include showing the presence of of several transmembrane or lipid-bound proteins, um, showing a cytosolic protein, but then very importantly, showing also that the samples are not contaminated with other, uh, with other bodies. So this could be uh, by excluding the presence of ER or Golgi markers um, or excluding the, the presence of extracellular proteins, such as things that we might find in serum um, or in other extracellular uh, media. Um, and so Ann Hendricks last year had, uh, had, had uh, organized a very nice um, consortium 
to look through the existing literature on EV methods. And then uh, she also created a database, a knowledge base that's called EV Track. Um, where you can go in and you can deposit your unpublished experiments or your published experiments, your published papers, uh, and, and obtain a score. So the score evaluates uh, various experimental um, details um, to determine how, um, I guess, how, how, how rigorous and reproducible the, the, um, the methodology is. And I just want to draw your attention here to that last point that I made on the previous slide. So in this spider web graph, you see that many papers that are present in the literature are telling us that they have EV enriched proteins. But almost no one is showing the presence of or the absence of non EV enriched proteins. And so I think that this is, um, I, I'm making this point um, because I think that it, it, it is very important. And, and as I will show you later, there are contaminants in all of our preparations that we have to be very, uh, very aware of. Um, we've also, we're also in the process, actually, I hope all of you will get involved with this, but we're in the process of renewing these MISA requirements involving many more people in the field um, in, in, in a manner that is akin to what has been done with autophagy um, by Kleonsky. So, um, so um, that being said, we, we attempt at least to do the best characterization that we can, um, but I will say that a lot of the experiments that I'm going to show you have been done with EVs that have been isolated by ultracentrifugation. Now, this is the standard method in the field. If you look at um, Chris Gardner's survey paper from last year, for example, um, you will see that ultracentrifugation continues to be the main workhorse um, in the EV field. But we all have to recognize that as standard as it is, it is imperfect. Um, and so the separation that we wish to achieve with ultracentrifugation is not always fully achieved, and we sometimes have to use other methods. Um, this is a, an exchange that I had recently um, on the Facebook page, the page of ISEV, where somebody asked, so, you know, what are what are some good references for um, for learning how to do ultracentrifugation of vesicles? And I I put up Clotilde's paper from 2006, and um, Hans van der Voorn, who many of you know is the um, the CEO of Izon, who brought us the the uh, uh, um, Q Nano instrument and also some some nice purification methods. He said 2006? Question mark. And in fact, yeah, you know, he's right. Ultracentrifugation has been around for a long time. And indeed, um, I, I really like the reference from Svedberg and Peterson from 1940. It gives you a lot of details on the, on the theory. Um, and ultracentrifugation has really been unchanged um, for about a century now. Um, I don't really think that it's old and busted. I think that it's a very valuable tool and continues to be, but we have to recognize the caveats. So, uh, so in our lab, for example, we, um, we, we will often do other um, or subsequent purification methods. And, um, and here I'm showing a gradient that was done by Zaha Liao in my lab, um, separa separating <clears throat> ultracentrifuged pellets uh, on an iodixinol gradient. So using the iodixinol gradient from light to heavy fractions, we're, we're able to separate HIV from non-HIV particles, but of course, all of the particles, whether uh, of, of purely cellular origin or reprogrammed by the virus over here, are going to contain EV markers because they're budding from the same membranes. Um, and even the internal markers, like some tenon, you can see that it seems to be a little bit reduced um, in, the, uh, in the, the virus containing fraction, but it is, is certainly there. Um, now, we uh, we examine a lot of cellular markers that, uh, like calnexin and GM130, so ER or Golgi markers that we don't expect to be enriched in EVs. Um, but of course, in our, in our HIV studies, we'll, we'll also look at other markers. And so the red line here shows you where the P24 protein of HIV is enriched. And we might find this actually in many fractions, the, uh, the incorporation of viral proteins or viral RNAs into non-virions um, over in these fractions is also possible, um, but certainly the HIV products are, are strongest here. Um, so you ask, what is the blue line? Now, the blue line indicates the fractions where we find um, acetylcholinesterase. And acetylcholinesterase is a, is a marker um, that we, we really wanted to, to work because, so I, I call this slide, my heart aches, um, ACHE, 
uh, it turns out is not really a reliable EV marker. And as had been reported in the MISEV uh, publication, um, ACHE can be associated with the outside of EVs. Um, but it is, um, in, in, in our hands anyway, over multiple experiments in different cell lines, we found that ACHE activity is never correlated with particle count. Um, and this is across different purification methods, different lines. Um, in fact, if we, if we look at what comes out of serum, so if we're using fairly um, uh, replete serum and trying to deplete the vesicles, it turns out that most of the ACHE activity is coming down in the early uh, centrifuge fractions and not the later fractions, which indicates, again, that um, acetylcholinesterase is not associated uh, with, with EVs and especially not small EVs. Um, so so we, we haven't been able to use that as a marker of, um, of vesicles as, 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 as easy as, as it would be. Um, no, but now to get to the addbacks after talking about uh, uh, characterization. If we take ultracentrifuge pellets from FDS and we add them back to our cultures, our, re our depleted cultures um, at different percentages, we're able to decrease the HIV production um, here, here, is, um, here is an example of, um, of what happens with T cells. We're reducing the production almost back to um, the, uh, the, the replete levels. Um, of course, FBS is full of vesicles from many different sources. So, um, so in, in the bloodstream, you're going to have a predominance of EVs from red blood cells and platelets, but you'll also have EVs from other sources such as endothelial cells, um, um, your, uh, your, your various leukocytes, um, and, and also EVs that are coming from, from uh, various organs of the body. So, um, so we're, we're in the process now of trying to catalog the effects of different EVs on this phenomenon that we see. Here's an example of uh, an experiment with PM1 and H9 vesicles. So these are two T lymphocytic lines. And as we add uh, these, these vesicles back to our, our, um, our, our depleted cultures and compare them with, with, uh, with what is happening in, with no treatment, we see that the different, um, the different pellets, so we're showing here the 2K pellet, the 10K pellet, and the 100K pellet all have similar effects on suppression of HIV production. Um, and then I also show the H9 100K pellet as a comparison. I think I just went backwards, excuse me. All right, so what could be responsible for this effect that we're seeing? Uh, my lab has had a strong interest in microRNAs for many years, um, starting with our work in a model of central nervous system disease um, associated with HIV infection. So our first thought was that the, the microRNAs in the FBS or in the serum vesicles are likely contributing to the suppression of HIV, and when you remove them, that suppression is alleviated. Um, it, it indeed has been reported for uh, over 10 years now that certain microRNAs, certain host microRNAs, suppress HIV infection. And I won't go through that literature, and I won't go through our previous publications on this, but I do want to share um, some, some very nice work that an undergraduate um, in my lab has done um, showing that there's another microRNA that has not been reported in, in relation to HIV yet um, that will suppress HIV replication in monocyte-derived macrophages. Um, and so this is MIR 186. And this paper, we're planning to submit it this weekend. We'll probably put it on bioarchives, so it should be out pretty soon. Um, but we, um, uh, we're, we're very confident that this is a, this is an, a new host microRNA that has effects on HIV replication. Um, however, when we looked in our, um, some of our different systems, including the, the monocyte-derived macrophage primary cell culture, our U1 latent cells and our ACH2 latent cells, um, and we profiled microRNAs in these different cultures, we found that there were no consistent differences when the cells were grown in replete EV conditions or depleted conditions. And so we have to conclude that the microRNAs are not, or likely not, responsible um, for the effect that we've seen. Um, what, what we did see, and this is, uh, this is a, a paper that we published last year, um, were that several genes, many genes in fact, that were um, that were related to steroid biosynthesis um, or other lipid biosynthesis were upregulated in the depleted conditions. 
And so we're following up on this finding right now to try to understand how it is that cells can recognize the presence of EVs around them. And we think that this, is, um, th this process is something akin to contact inhibition or quorum sensing, um, where when the cell senses that there's not a lot of membrane around it, um, whether that membrane is on an EV or not, we don't know. Um, but when the cell senses that dirt, it begins to uh, produce more sterols. It, it begins to produce more of those um, components of the membranes that, um, that EVs and HIV like to bud through. All right, so I, I, I now want to present the caveat that I mentioned, and that is, is, is it possible that there are other uh, components of, the, of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fractions that we're using here um, that could be responsible for some of the effects? So, so I've told you about how uh, EV conditions can affect HIV production. They can also affect how cells, um, how the susceptibility of cells to HIV infection. So, for example, this is a reporter line um, where um, uh, we have luciferase under the control of a TAT-responsive promoter, HIV TAT-responsive promoter. Um, and when we grow cells in depleted conditions versus replete conditions, we see that the luciferase activity increases um, upon exposure to virus. What this means is that the cell is, um, is more susceptible to the viral infection. Um, so we found that when we deplete serum of EVs, we're also depleting serum of, of, of other particles. Um, and this is probably not a surprise to many of you, but you find that HDL and LDL are, are both going down. Um, and in particular, the LDL seems to be, um, seems to be reduced with, uh, with our EV depletion protocols. Um, interestingly enough, this is not just a factor of our, um, our, our isolation protocol, which is, which is ultracentrification. We can also see um, that with a flotation gradient prep, so flotation gradients are, are kind of the, you know, as good as you can get um, with separating things by, by density. Um, and, and even with those flotation gradients, we observed um, a, uh, what, what appear to be some EVs in with an LDL prep. All right, so um, several, uh, let's see, uh, where, where are we here? Okay, um, so, so we, we sought to determine whether the LDL or the HDL could also be having an effect on the HIV life cycle. And so pre-treating our cells, our reporter cells, for two hours with LDL or HDL at different concentrations uh, before infecting with the virus, um, we didn't really see um, any, any decline of the EV depleted condition back to the EV replete condition. But after 24 hours of treatment with the LDL but not with the HDL, we did see um, that decline. And so we have to conclude from this that while EVs appear to uh, contribute to the suppressive effects on HIV, um, they, are not, they are likely not the only component of our systems that are contributing. Okay, so now I want to move on to the cigarette smoke um, portion of the talk for the last few minutes. Um, this, is a, this is a project that is funded by NIDA, um, and my co-investigators on this project are Matthias Ostrowski in Buenos Aires and Clotilde Terry um, in Paris. So the hypothesis of this, of this whole project is that um, in HIV-positive smokers, uh, smoking can contribute um, to exacerbating the non- uh, the non-AIDS conditions that are now um, well known in HIV infection. So cigarette smoking in HIV positive populations, uh, like, like the use of many other drugs, is about two to fourfold higher um, than in, than in uh, matched populations. And the cigarette, the effects of cigarette smoking are, are, um, are, are the things that I don't have to cover here, but they include the cardiovascular effects, um, inflammation, Th1, Th17 skewing, and even things that can increase susceptibility um, of cells to HIV infection. So maybe the, the cigarette smoking can help to, to, to keep a, an infection going. Um, how, do, how do we study cigarette smoke and, and cigarette smoke exposure? Well, there are a few ways um, that, that we can collect materials from cigarettes. Uh, one of those would be to make an extract. The extract is going to be collecting the water-soluble portions of smoke. Another way to do this would be to smoke the cigarette onto a metal 
plate essentially and, uh, and, and, and collect that condensate. So treating this plate then with DMSO or with alcohol would let you collect the particulates um, and then put those particulates into your, your uh, system of interest. Um, another model that I'll, I'll mention is the direct smoke exposure. Here you might seed um, epithelial cells onto an air-liquid interface and pass cigarette smoke um, over, the, over the apical side um, of those cells uh, that on their basolateral side are in contact with medium. Um, then you could collect the basolateral medium um, as, as kind of the collection of whatever, whatever portion of the cigarette smoke gets through the cells and then also whatever the cells are releasing in response to the cigarette smoke. Uh, it, uh, we, we have done, we have done uh, numbers one and three here in our group, um, but mostly we have focused on the extract, the water-soluble portion of the smoke. All right, and here is how you, here is how you make it. So you take a, um, we typically use a five mil pipette and we will submerge that into our, um, our medium. And then we'll use a peristaltic pump to draw the air from a cigarette that has been lit through a tube and bubble it up through the water, or I'm sorry, through the medium. Um, of course, you can imagine that there are a lot of different variables that have to be considered here. Um, do, you, do you use the filter on the cigarette or do you take it off? Um, how quickly do you smoke the cigarette? Um, how much do you dilute the medium? And here is an experiment that a, an undergraduate in my lab, Eric Bernstein, has done, um, where he examined the effects of using a gel loading tip um, to submerge into your medium versus the five mil pipette tip. The difference here is a tenfold um, difference in diameter, so from 0.37 millimeters up to 3.7 millimeters. And in case you're like me and you don't remember these formulae from uh, high school, um, the area and the volume of a sphere, um, the surface area and the volume are, are indicated here. So, so, so basically, if you're using a gel loading tip, um, the same volume of smoke is going to have a, a, a tenfold higher opportunity um, to, to be passed into the medium than if you're using the five mil tip. Um, and in fact, this difference, this di this difference has, has functional consequences. So, um, so down here are results from Eric's experiments where he showed that um, control cells are very happy and they're almost 100% viable. But then as you add the cigarette smoke at 40% or 80% uh, from the 5 mil pipette, you see a decline in viability. And then by using the gel tip where you have a much higher surface volume, uh, I'm sorry, surface area of, um, of, of the cigarette smoke bubbles, you, um, you eventually get down to an almost zero uh, viability of these cells. So, so cigarette smoke... I, I actually love cigarette smoke in the lab, um, but I would encourage everybody to to avoid it if you can um, in your um, outside your day job. So here's a, here's the gel loading tip after Eric has smoked one cigarette through it, and uh, and and you can see how there's um, a lot of accumulation of, um, of of just junk here from the cigarette. That's your lungs. All right, so, um, so the methods that we use uh, in these experiments are we, we get blood from healthy human donors uh, who are uninfected, and then we select cells, and, uh, including monocytes. So the monocytes are used for uh, dendritic cell maturation um, or macrophage maturation. We freeze back our autologous T cells because we want to do all this um, as, as autologous experiments. Um, and we're using throughout uh, NIDA reference cigarettes. So in case you didn't know, NIDA has a collection of cigarettes that are available um, to investigators um, to ensure that there is substantial reproducibility um, between experiments. Um, then we expose the dendritic cells to the cigarette smoked medium and purify EVs from the dendritic cells. These, uh, these EVs are then used to treat autologous T cells in serum-free medium um, and then we examine various immune phenotypes at one, two, and three days um, of exposure. So some of the effects that we see uh, here, I'm showing CD69 expression and HLA-DR expression, seem to be um, independent of whether the cells have been exposed to cigarette smoke or not. In contrast, there are other effects. So in this, um, in this slide, I'm showing you um, ROR gamma T, IL-17A, IL-2, and interferon gamma. Um, most of which respond in a, in a very dose-dependent fashion to the cigarette-smoked 
um, EVs from dendritic cells. In contrast, control conditions, um, including control exposed um, dendritic cells, do not produce these effects. So this is a, um, a very strong skewing that we see towards Th1 and Th17 responses, and in, in contrast, there's not really much of an effect on Th2 markers. All right, to, so um, to go back to the latency experiments, uh, where I had showed you the effects of EV depletion and then add back. Um, here, here's what happen, happens if we take the, our ACH2 cells and expose them to the um, to different types of medium and the EVs from different um, different cells and different exposure conditions. So as um, as, as we have previously seen, um, in red is the uh, R10 replete medium. In blue is uh, cells that are grown in the AIM5 serum-free medium. There's a decline in, in, in proliferation and viability of the cells that are grown in the AIM-5 medium, um, but this effect is not large. And so by and large, we have, uh, we have healthy cells here. Um, but here is the, here's the effect of EVs and CS, CSEM EVs on virus release. Um, and so you can see that in the um, cells that are grown in the R10 medium, that is the EV replete conditions, they have, again, lower P24 release than the cells that are not. Um, the cells that are grown in the, in the completely serum-free conditions have much greater uh, P24 release. And when we add um, vesicles from our T lymphocytic line back to these cells, um, we, see a, we see a decline um, in P24 production. So again, the vesicles are suppressing the viral replication. Um, and there's also a decline that's seen with the, um, with the cigarette smoked um, uh, H9 cell EVs, but it's not as pronounced. Um, and here's a separate experiment that was done by Daniel Smith, a student in my lab, um, and we see very similar results. And here you can also observe the dose dependence of the um, of the addition of EVs from the different conditions. But again, um, it seems it seems here that there is not a um, a substantial effect of the CSE. Um, uh, the, 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 the cigarette smoke on, on, the, um, on the P24 production. All right, so what might be mediating the effects of these EVs? Um, so I want to show a couple of slides here from Matthias Ostrowski's lab, um, some work that we've done in collaboration with him as part of this project. Um, Matthias is very interested in, in hypoxia-inducible factor one alpha um, and has done some very nice work that's been submitted for publication um, showing that HIF-1 alpha um, is, is activated by, uh, by HIV infection. Um, and so he's using a reporter line here. So first of all, he shows the translocation of HIF-1 alpha. He shows that it's upregulated. Um, and we've been able to show with his reporter line that uh, different types of virus will increase um, HIF-1 alpha, um, the HIF-1 alpha reporter in a dose-dependent fashion. So but it's not just the virus that will do this. It turns out that EVs um, from cells that have been exposed to a virus that, that can only do a single round of infection, so it can get into the cells, but it does not integrate into the into the uh, genome of the cell, and thus it cannot um, it cannot uh, replicate efficiently. Even these EVs are able to elicit um, this strong this strong response, whereas EVs from uh, mock infected cells will not. Okay, so that's so that's one thing that we're looking at. Another possibility um, that we've uh, investigated with Sismita Sahu recently, and I understand that Sismita um, gave a presentation to you a few weeks ago, um, was to look at the role of RNA modifications. Um, so it turns out that in smoked cells, um, we see a large increase, um, a significant increase in M6A modification of total RNA in the cell. And a lot of this is driven by a decline in the FTO enzyme. This is the enzyme um, the eraser enzyme for the M6A modification. Um, and then we also see um, great increases in uh, some of the, the, the co-receptors for HIV in these cells. Um, but when we examine then the, the, the EVs that have been released from the smoked cells, we observe that the, uh, the increase in M6A modification is even larger in the EVs than it was in the cells. And so I just draw your attention to this uh, C panel right here. Um, and we also um, have, have release of, of some of the mRNAs for these, uh, these co-receptors for HIV. Um, 
And as we're looking through the data, we, um, we noticed that the sites of modification of the, um, on the CCR5, uh, this is one of the co-receptors, the CCR5 3' UTR, coincide with two of the known MIR-150 binding sites um, in the, in the 3' UTR of this, um, of this transcript. Um, and this is interesting to us because in a previous study we had shown that MIR-150 declined in the plasma of viremic patients um, compared with elite suppressors who in turn were, uh, had lower MIR-150 than in control uh, infected, uh, control individuals, uh, healthy individuals. Um, and furthermore, in unpublished data, um, we have seen that there's a decline also in the EVs from those individuals. Um, so there might be a role for micronase after all. Um, and and I'll, I'll just finally leave you with this little tidbit on circular RNAs that we purified um, from the cells that are exposed to, P uh, to, to cigarette smoke or not. These are PM1 T lymphocytic uh, uh, cells. Um, and so we see some, some striking differences in, in several of the circular microRNAs, I'm sorry, the circular RNAs that can bind to microRNAs um, that, are, that are produced in these cells. So I will conclude now and let you get to your questions um, by saying that the EV environment does appear to influence several stages of the HIV life cycle. Um, and we are currently investigating whether this is just a general phenomenon or if it varies by EV, um, EV cell origin. So we've al already seen the T lymphocytic um, lines do this, FBS uh, bulk EVs do this. There are several others that, that, that do it, but it could be that there are some cells that will produce EVs that will stimulate um, production. We also um, have observed that EVs appear to propagate some of the effects of cigarette smoke exposure, including the well-known uh, TH1, TH17 skewing um, of immune cells in cigarette smoke exposure. Uh, and then finally, EVs can transmit signals in HIV infection and smoke exposure that tend to be uh, inflammatory, um, even if they don't affect the overall production of HIV. So thanks very much for, um, again, for the invitation and for your great time, and I'd be pleased to take any questions you might have. Ken, yeah, thank you. Very, very nice talk. Um, so your lines will be unmuted now. Just a reminder, uh, if you're not speaking, if you could mute your phone just to keep the background noise down. And if you could identify yourself, that'd be great. So any questions uh, for Ken? Hi, Ken. This is Lillian from NIAID. Um, thank you for this talk and going through a lot of really exciting and uh, diverse topics. Um, I, I wanted to circle back to your experiments regarding uh, enforcing latency. I, I'm sorry if I missed this. Um, I, I didn't quite understand the experiment. You know, are you using P24 and the supernatant as a readout for latency? Yeah, so these lines um, do have a baseline P24 production. Um, so, so they're not they're um, they're they're not fully latent under under any condition, um, but they can be stimulated by addition of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, for example. Um, and what we find is that when we when we grow the cells in serum replete conditions, so full serum, um, that baseline level is something that you know we, we know we know exactly what to expect. But when we switch them to um, to, to serum starved conditions or or EV depleted conditions or um, or serum free conditions, then we see an increase in the um, in the P24 production. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think we have a question uh, on the chat box. Uh, I think this is from Jan. Um, it says, in the smoke experiments, could the EVs be contaminated by material from the smoke? Yes, so that's, um, that's a, a really good question. Um, and we, we can't exclude that. Um, so so we're, we're working on trying to answer that question, um, but we, um, I guess I guess you'd kind of have to envision that the the EVs would have a certain adherence for some of the some of the cigarette smoke uh, components um, because the dilution that occurs with the purification um, is is such that we really don't expect there to be much of anything at all um, from the cigarette from the cigarette smoke left and so we've also done controls where we try to 
um, we, we, we try to purify, um, we, we, or I should say we use our same EV purification protocols on simply smoked medium. Um, and there we, you know, we don't, we don't get, um, we don't get these effects. So the, um, I guess, I guess the, the possibility is that some of the EVs are binding to, um, to some of this material and then transferring it. And that's, um, that's something that we cannot yet um, exclude. Other questions for Kim? Uh, Follow-up question from Jan. Is there a change in printing cargo after smoke? So a change in protein cargo, not that we have seen, but we have not done full-scale proteomics on these particles. I'd be happy to, uh, to send somebody some samples if you'd like to do it. Okay, last call. Questions for Ken? If not, I'm sure Ken would be happy to take any questions via email. Uh, Ken, thank you again. I really appreciate it. And just for everyone, uh, you can make a note of this. The next speaker uh, will be David Wong from UCLA. He'll be talking on Thursday, March 1st. Uh, just one note is that the, uh, the webinar will start one hour later than normal. So whatever time zone you're in, just uh, please make a note of that. It'll be one hour later. Uh, thanks again, Ken, and thank all of you for attending.